Can childhood, fame, and big money be combined? And is there any happiness in this equation? The names of these three young wizards have become household names all over the world. Their fans are numbered in the hundreds of thousands and the royalties are estimated in the millions. But what was the price for tremendous success at such an early age? How did the young wizards begin their journey to fame and were they able to get rid of the haunting roles? Today on the Biographer Channel, we'll talk about who Emma Watson, Rupert Grint, and Daniel Radcliffe really are. What are they doing now and what have they been through to stop being wizards and become independent actors? If you have not learned how to transgress, we suggest using the magic of YouTube to be transported to the magical world. Subscribe to our channel and enable notifications under this video and I guarantee you'll have a fabulous time. Emma Charlotte Duer Watson was born on April 15, 1990 in Paris. Her father, Chris Watson, was an Englishman. Her mother was a French woman named Jacqueline Lusby. Both parents were far from art and worked as lawyers. According to one version, the girl received a name in honor of her paternal grandmother and according to another, in honor of a good family friend. When Emma was five, her family broke up. Chris Watson left for his homeland and so that the children would not lose touch with their father, Jacqueline took Emma and her younger brother Alex and moved to Oxford. Therefore, Emma spent her childhood in two houses, as she lived either with her mother in Oxford or with her father in London. At the age of three, the girl fell in love with theater, and already at seven she received her first acting award for reading poetry at a school competition among readers. For the rest of her life, Emma strived for education and achievement of goals. In an interview with GQ, she admitted that in order to get enough attention from her relatives, she had to do at least two things – to have a good conversation at the dinner table or to do well at school. Therefore, this became her goal as it was valued the most. In addition, Emma admitted that her father didn't know how to raise a girl. She was treated like an adult from childhood. He treated me like a boy. He didn't do kid stuff. We'd play tennis and he'd smack the ball as hard at me as he did with anyone else he played. From 1995 to 2001, Emma had been attending the Dragon School in Oxford, but never forgot her childhood dream. Seeing her desire, her mother sent Emma to the Stagecoach Theatre Arts Acting School. It was there that the girl tried out the first roles on herself, playing both the evil witch Morgana in King Arthur and the Swallow from the play The Swallow and the Prince, based on the work of Oscar Wilde. Teachers of the Stagecoach Acting School saw the girl's potential and sent her portfolio to the manager who was engaged in selection of actors for roles in the first Potter film. The girl knew about the magical world of Harry Potter even before casting. When Emma was seven, her father liked to read books to her on long car trips and she fell in love with this story. She especially liked Hermione because she was able to see herself in the character. Um, I think Hermione has great charisma. You know, she's bossy, she's swatty, she's top of the class, you know, she's very, I know what I'm doing. Um, and that is why she is so funny and that is why her charisma and character is, is just so great. Just like the young sorceress, Emma was very fond of reading. Growing up, she even created her own book club where you can find literature about feminism and human rights. It's hard to say whether it was just luck or her talent, but Emma got a chance to try out for the role of her favorite heroine. Later, the actress admitted that she was not sure that the chosen path was the career that she would consciously want for herself. But I guess I just wanted to be sure it's what I want. I was so young and I don't think I really knew the greatness of what I was signing on for. This is not surprising given that the girl got a serious role at the age of nine. Of course, it wasn't a conscious choice. Moreover, she couldn't know what consequences it could entail. But it was this role that changed the girl's life and overnight, Hermione literally woke up a celebrity. The future red-haired wizard was born on August 24, 1988 in the small town of Harlow. The parents named their boy Rupert Alexander Lloyd Grint. His father, Nigel Grint, owned a gift shop. His mother, Joanna Parsons, led the household and raised five children, among whom, in addition to Rupert, three younger sisters of the future actor grew up – Georgina, Samantha, Charlotte, and brother James. 
When the boy was 12, his parents divorced. In the elementary Catholic school named after St. Joseph, the boy became interested in amateur performances, which he showed to the younger children in his family. The boy became seriously interested in theater. He enrolled in the Top Hat Stage School and even participated in school productions, among which was the role of a fish in a play about Noah's Ark. Unlike his screen hero, Grint grew up as a very obedient child. Probably the worst thing I did was steal a hairbrush and a Billy Goat's gruff book from a local shop. I think I went in with the intention of nicking something and I must have panicked and grabbed the first two things I saw. Clearly a life of crime wasn't for me. Then the boy entered Richard Hale's secondary school in Hertfordshire. His red unruly hair always attracted attention. His great-grandfather nicknamed him Copper Knob, and his friends at school called him Ginge, short for Ginger. Like Emma, Rupert was familiar with the world of Potter even before the casting. By this point, three books had already been written and Grint himself was a fan of the young wizard's adventure. He was especially impressed by the red-haired Ron in whom the future actor recognized himself. Reading the book, he was always... I just always saw myself in him in, in quite a deep way. Um, I think because he's, he's just very real, I think he's, he's... Therefore, when he found out that a set of actors of the film adaptation of Rowling's novel have been announced, the boy decided to try his luck. Grint's first attempt failed. He didn't receive an answer, but Rupert didn't give up and approached the question in a very unusual way. So I figured out there was nothing to lose by being a little inventive. My video was in three parts. There was a rap about myself, I dressed up as a woman and did a little sketch in the character of my drama teacher, and then I read some Ron Weasley dialogue. And this worked. The boy received an invitation to audition. He became the envy of red-haired boys all over the world. And his life, in his own words, was divided into the period before and after. Daniel Jacob Radcliffe was born on July 23, 1989 at Queen Charlotte's and Chelsea Hospital in Hammersmith, West London. He is the only child of Marcia Janine Gresham and literary agent Alan George Radcliffe. From an early age, Daniel showed his interest in acting. When he was five, his mother brought him to a comedy production. He recalled turning to her and saying, I want to be an actor. And she, being a former actress from personal experience, replied, no, you do not want to do that. Daniel stopped thinking about it for a while. The reason for such categoricalness of his mother was the peculiarity of the boy. Daniel had been suffering from dyspraxia since childhood. The disease manifested itself in problems with coordination, speech disorders, and learning difficulties. I don't hide my illness. Most people prefer to hide their diagnosis. They are ashamed of it. You don't need to do this. Yes, something inside my skull went wrong, but it's not my fault. I'm quite an adequate person, and in my opinion, I live a full-fledged life." Marsha worked as a casting agent for BBC Productions. Once, there was an audition for the role of David Copperfield for BBC One, and she was offered to bring Daniel. Maybe he can have an audition, just as a complacency he tried, she thought. So at the age of 10, the actor made his debut in the two-part adaptation of Charles Dickens' novel David Copperfield in 1999, portraying the main character as a child. Immediately after that, in 2001, Daniel made his feature film debut, The Tailor of Panama, based on the 1996 spy novel by John Le Carré. By that time, one major director had already became interested in Daniel Radcliffe, and fate was already preparing a big surprise for the boy. But more on that later. His education faded into the background. For all that time, Daniel studied at three independent schools for boys in London. Redcliffe School, Sussex House School, and the City of London School. It was because of his acting career which began to develop at a rapid pace. It was hard for Dan to study. Many classmates began to treat the boy with hostility after the release of his next film. They bullied him and felt jealous. What exactly was this movie? I think many have already guessed it. It wasn't easy to get into the world of Harry Potter. By the time of wizard selection for the world of magic, the book was a huge success among children and young people, and therefore there were plenty of people who wanted to impress everyone at the casting. 
The fourth part of the series was on the way, and Rowling accepted an offer from Warner Brothers about the film adaptation, putting forward a number of conditions including personal control of the casting selection process. In addition, it was required to take exclusively British school kids between ages of 9 and 11 for the roles. The audition took place in several stages. First, potential wizards had to read their own chosen page from Harry Potter. After that, they should stage an impromptu arrival at the School of Magic, and in conclusion, to play out several pages of the script. Therefore, each of the contenders were seriously prepared. As you probably understand, Emma Watson thoroughly approached the auditions. At the same time, the girl didn't fully believe that she would be able to get the coveted role because she had to compete with hundreds of contenders for the place of Hermione Granger. It's interesting that Watson was also supported by the author of the children's book about the wizard, J.K. Rowling, who liked the girl. For filming, the young actress had to dye her hair brown as the girl was originally a blonde. In an interview in 2014, she said that, in her opinion, she was chosen because she was obsessed with the role of Hermione. I was completely obsessive and I would do it over and over and over again. Funny enough, in the first Harry Potter film, if you watch carefully in some scenes, you can see me mouthing Harry and Ron's lines as well as my own, because that's just what I was like. I was crazy. Rupert also kept up and knew the entire Potter book by heart. That's why he went through the next stages of casting rather quickly. By the way, like his hero, the actor is terribly afraid of spiders. They say he couldn't watch the second part of the Harry Potter movies because of this. He is a unique caricature artist and can create any solid impression within 60 seconds. The selection of an actor for a key role was more difficult. Rowling was looking for an unknown British actor to play the boy, and he had to have blue eyes. It's been nine months, 16,000 applicants were selected by this moment for the role of Harry, but nobody fit. It got to the point that they began to joke on the set and said, we'll shoot a film without Harry Potter. The film's director, Chris Columbus, recalled thinking, this is what I want, this is Harry Potter, after seeing a video of the young actor in David Copperfield. Initially, Dan's parents were against it, and producer David Heyman had to try hard to persuade them to let his son go to the audition. After several auditions, Radcliffe was chosen for the role. J.K. Rowling supported this choice, stating, I don't think Chris Columbus could have found a better Harry. Daniel recalled, I had two reactions when I found out about the role. I cried at first because I was so happy, and then a few hours later, I woke up in the middle of the night, ran to my parents in the bedroom to ask if I had a dream. After passing the audition, the guys were introduced to each other. It was these three who would work together on the set for the next 12 years, going through hard work and a lot of impressions. They should support each other and, in the end, become a family. Immediately after the approval of the future wizards, the group photo of this trio was captured, and then it was posted on the internet with the news that the candidates had been selected. And got the first part I ever auditioned for. I mean, it's like, it's so bizarre and otherworldly what happened to me. Initially, they signed a contract with young actors only for the first two movies, and therefore the film crew had to constantly review the working conditions of the guys. The filming was intense, but passed quite calmly. Chris Columbus strongly supported the young actors and Daniel in particular. They had enough free time while preparations were made and scenes with other actors were filmed. Dan said more than once that Columbus was the perfect fit, as he was great at working with kids and charging them with enthusiasm. He was amazing with us. Like, I don't think anybody else could have got the enthusiasm out of those out of just three the nicest kids. guy in the world. It wasn't without mischief. Daniel made fun and grimaced at the camera and also arranged pranks on the set. For example, he took co-star Robbie Coltrane's cellular phone and changed it so all the messages were in Turkish. Dan, say, I can't look at you right now. I'm looking at the grass. Grass is more important than camera. Go away. Dan once scared the makeup department crew when he came on set with bloodied sticking plasters on his face, claiming that he had been fighting the previous day. Rupert Grint also recalled his first filming experience with admiration. Walking into the Great Hall for the first time was absolutely incredible. All these effects with all the candles floating in the air, all lit and everything, food on the table, all the flambeaux were lit. It was just incredible. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. During the first two films, Emma was called one take due to her ability to act out her scenes in one go. 
The girl was so passionate about her work that she learned not only her role, but also the words of her colleagues. Due to the fact that in the frame she spoke the lines of the other kids, the operator had some troubles. This is actually quite traumatic for me because I created issues because of this. Oh, really? Yes. What issues? I would, I would ruin takes. <laughs> Chris would be like, cut, Emma, you're doing it again. Grint, at first, didn't know how to behave in the frame. His roles were not easy for him, and it was hard for him to act out the scene for one take. They used to call me Go Again Grint because I could never do anything without doing it like 20 times, the actor confessed. In addition, until the last films, Grint couldn't help laughing in serious scenes. For example, during the funeral of Dumbledore. Me and Dan were notoriously pretty bad. I mean, it was ever we kind of had a scene together. On November 4th, 2001, the premiere of the movie Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, expected by thousands of J.K. Rowling fans around the world, took place. The picture broke the records of one-day box office ticket sales in the United States and was met with enthusiasm, both among viewers and critics. Many highly appreciated the incarnations of Rowling's heroes. For example, John Hiscock of the Daily Telegraph lauded the wonderful Radcliffe and the great performances of Grint and Watson. Jay Boyer from the Orlando Sentinel described the film's casting as to the point, highlighting both the child actors and the outstanding and terrific adult cast. The New Yorker said that the young actors were credible, particularly Emma Watson. The picture raised $1 billion, was nominated for an Oscar three times, and got a whole collection of prestigious awards. In 2002, the film Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets was released. The studio had to shoot it quickly because the children were growing up. The film won the Broadcast Music Incorporated Film and TV Awards for Best Family Film and grossed $878 million, a significant return on investment. The lives of the guys changed after the filming of Potter, but their parents tried to do everything so that the children didn't get sick with Starstruck. In an interview, Watson admitted that she still had to do household chores and keep an eye on her younger brother. Parents tried to raise her as modestly as possible, and even after her name became known, they tried to treat both children equally. The biggest compliment I've ever had, getting ready for a premiere or whatever, is that I scrub up all right, she said. Perhaps it was this approach to education that led to the fact that for two decades not a single scandal happened with the actress. The film adaptation of Rowling's work was such a success that the creators decided to shoot six more pictures in addition to the first two ones. The main characters quickly became celebrities. There were press outside of our house. It was like this crazy whirlwind, like something from a movie. The cameras were flashing. It was just... <sighs> Scary. It was. Did yeah. a lot of people stop you and ask you for your autographs? Yes. Yeah. That's weird. Grit recalled how the first days of fame inspired him. He first felt this when, after filming the first movie, he returned to school for his exams and the whole class greeted him with a standing ovation. The childhood of the actors ended there. For almost 11 months a year, they were busy on the set, and in between the periods of filming, they tried to gnaw the granite of science. However, the implementation of the third film was postponed for some time. Daniel's parents wanted their child to be able to go to school at least for a while and study as a common kid. For this purpose, the children were allocated four hours a day for learning. However, it was not possible to combine study with work, frankly. Radcliffe continued his education through on-set tutors. The actor has admitted to not being a very good student, considering school useless and finding the work really difficult. Later in 2006, Daniel achieved A grades in the three AS level exams that he took, but decided to take a break from education and didn't attend university. Grant also found the school program very difficult, but Emma did quite well. In order to act, the actress transferred to the Headington School for Girls, which she graduated remotely. She devoted five hours every day to cramming the school curriculum, and in 2006, she received a certificate full of A grades. In 2008, Emma decided to improve her professional skills and completed a summer acting course at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. The next step was admission to Brown University, where she received a bachelor's degree in English literature. After filming in the fifth part of the Harry Potter series, the Trinity became so famous that they were honored to leave their hand and footprints on the famous Avenue of Stars in Hollywood. But in the same period, the young wizards ran out of steam. 
Before the university entrance exams, there were rumors that Emma was not going to play in the sixth part of the saga. I didn't want to be completely dependent on the filming process for the next three years, she said in an interview. But representatives of Warner Brothers still managed to convince her to stay. They say that the size of the actress's fee and the huge support of the fans played an important role in this. Rupert Grint told something similar. After filming Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the actor doubted whether to continue. I thought, do I actually want to keep doing this? Because obviously it's a big sacrifice. You take for granted anonymity, just doing normal stuff, just going out. Everything was different and a little bit scary. There were times when I was like, I'm done. It didn't get any easier. One of the most difficult was the film adaptation of Rowling's last book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which consisted of two parts. The film director, David Yates, put the actors in rather tense conditions. Constant lack of sleep due to a busy schedule, exhaustion, and shooting in difficult conditions. Watson and Grant got a lot of scenes in which they had to be wet and cold. When the girl shared her problems with Yates, the director assured her that her emaciated state looked great on camera. There were days when I was in tears to David, because more than anything, being cold and wet all the time just takes so much energy out of you. It's so draining. And trying to give a good performance when you are just miserable and want to go to sleep. The scene where Harry's friends drink a potion to become visual clones of him and help protect him required as much as 95 takes. To make matters worse, Daniel Radcliffe had to imitate the movement patterns of each of the actors and make the scene more believable. Grant also admitted that filming was sometimes too difficult. There was a time where it felt quite suffocating because it was heavy going, because it was every day for 10 years in the end. It was a great experience, but sometimes it definitely felt like, I want to do something else, see what else is out there. Grint, Radcliffe, and Watson became very close because they shared this experience together. However, when the trio wasn't on the set, they rarely hung out together. Despite their shared affection for each other, they needed some much-needed time apart after the completion of each film. By the way, the guys left a few relics after filming as a reminder of a great period of their lives. So Watson admitted that she took the wand, the time wheel, and the cloak. Radcliffe took his glasses, wand, and many other Hogwarts paraphernalia. Grint acted differently. He slowly stole interesting gizmos on the set. For example, the number of the Dursley's house or the Golden Dragon's egg was estimated at several thousand dollars. The egg, however, had to be returned. Well, Rupert was in his repertoire. And what artifact from the filming would you like to take? Write about it in the comments. We will definitely like the most interesting options. The famous franchise brought fame and money to the young actors, but as usual, it also had negative consequences. Filming absorbed almost all of their free time, and therefore the actors had practically no childhood and were forced to sacrifice a significant part of their personal lives. In an interview with Vogue, Emma shared that one of the films in the franchise distracted her during an intimate moment. One of the movies appeared in the background on TV, and it made the actress feel uncomfortable. And all I can hear is the Harry Potter theme tune as I'm kissing someone, and I'm like, do I turn it off? Do I just ignore this? Is he thinking about this? Is it just me thinking about this? Maybe he just doesn't know what the Harry Potter theme tune sounds like. Maybe it's just me. Also, it didn't go without the molestation of paparazzi who watched the young wizards day and night in order to find out all the details of their personal and professional lives. Daniel even found a way to deal with them. For a while, he wore the same jacket and cap so that the paparazzi couldn't take new photos. Harry Potter influenced the rest of the lives of the actors. It was a very kind of overwhelming time. It just suddenly everything changed, and then after that, nothing was ever the same. Crowds of fans pursued the guys who became a living embodiment of a dream for the audience. Later, Emma admitted she was still afraid to go out for a walk down the street or ride a train. Daniel stated that some people would never be able to separate him from the Harry Potter character. However, he said he was proud to be associated with this film series forever. Dan suffered from fame the most. While working on the last part of the saga, he became very addicted to alcohol. At the same time, the actor drank both during the filming and when the shooting ended. Daniel said that he began to abuse for a completely banal reason. He couldn't stand the fame that fell on him. His every step was watched, and to cope with constant tension, he started to drink a lot. 
A sense of responsibility was added since by the time the Deathly Hollows came out, the guy had become the breadwinner of the family. He felt the uncertainty of the future because the saga was coming to an end. At the same time, he was seized by panic, since the actor didn't know at all what to do next, but he only felt comfortable when he was drunk. At first, I thought it was bad if I went out and got drunk. I was afraid of increased interest, because it's not just a drunk guy, it's, oh, Harry Potter got drunk in a bar. This caused people a little derisive interest. They were amused. To cope with this, I drank more, got drunker, and this went on for several years. But we must give Daniel his due. He always behaved politely on the set without manifestations of star disease. Radcliffe proved himself to be an extremely reliable actor and only took two days off during the entire ten years of filming. But the obvious advantage of taking part in the franchise, of course, was that the young actors weren't afraid of poverty. Emma Watson earned $80 million from all eight movies, while her pay for the first four Harry Potter movies isn't known. Celebrity Net Worth reports that Watson made $4 million for Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix in 2007 and a combined $30 million for the last two Harry Potter movies. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 1 and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows Part 2 in 2010 and 2011. In an interview, Emma admitted that she didn't know until the age of 18 how much she earned on the Harry Potter films. Her father told her about this when he considered that the girl was old enough. Prior to this, she was only given $75 per week as a weekly allowance. By the third or fourth film, the money was starting to get serious. I had no idea. I felt sick, very emotional. After her real income was revealed to her, Watson was able to afford her first major expenses. In a 2009 interview, she recalled that she was able to buy herself a laptop, take her father on vacation to Tuscany, and later buy herself a car. I got my license last year and I love the Prius, even if my friends say it's ugly. They say I drive a brick. And to be fair, it's not the prettiest car on the road, but it's good for the environment. It's sensible and boring, like me. Rupert Grint got a little less than Emma. In total, for eight films, he earned $60 million. But unlike the actress, he was less bothered about how to spend his savings. In one of the interviews, he admitted that he didn't understand what to do with this money. It was quite overwhelming, he said. Rupert's first purchase was an ice cream van, which he had dreamed of since his early childhood. In one of the interviews, he admitted that he still periodically traveled around the neighborhood and distributed ice cream to children for free. They'll say, ain't you Ron Weasley? And I'll say, it's strange, I get asked that a lot. The second purchase of the young actor was a hovercraft, which he never mastered, admitting that he once almost died on it. When the guy turned 16, he bought himself a farm, a real farm, with a lake, a herd of pigs, and a golf course. I had alpacas and pigs, it was a whole thing. Around 16 years old, it was chaos. Alpacas are insane. Now looking back, in hindsight, rationalizing it, I guess I just did stupid things like that. However, colleagues who know him very well were not surprised by Rupert's purchases. Basically has done, you know, with his money what the rest of us would have done with our money, when what we said we'd all do when we were seven, you know, and just have Isn't a kind of really wonka house. I'm really it's happy. Me I'm really pleased we about always, that. We always make jokes about Rupert like, because we, we always He's take his sort dream. of... He is living the dream. And we always say he gets out of bed, just into the water flume, down to the breakfast <laughs> table. That's how he sort of travels around his house. Daniel earned the most. His total earnings were about $109 million. Later, the actor admitted that he was terrible at splashing the cash and didn't attach much importance to his money. He also told the Belfast Telegraph that he would like to be careful with his money so that he could freely choose any roles he liked, since money implied a significant amount of freedom. For all the people who followed my career, I want to give them something to be interested in, rather than them just watching me make loads of money on crap films the rest of my life. Radcliffe spent his savings mainly on real estate and his collection of contemporary art, arguing that it was art that was worth spending a round sum on. A specially made Savior mattress for £12,500 sterling is his most non-standard purchase. However, the Boy Who Lived franchise came to an end and it was time to move on.
In addition to filming in Harry Potter, Emma tried to be active on the sidelines. In 2005, she began her modeling career. The first professional photo shoot of a 15-year-old girl was shooting for Teen Vogue magazine. Her photo graced the cover of the November issue. In 2007, Emma's first non potterian film, Ballet Shoes, was released. It was a television adaptation of Noel Stratfield's novel. Here, the young actress got one of the main roles, the little orphan Paulina Fossil, who, along with her stepsisters, was trying to survive with the help of her talent. The lyrical drama directed by Sandra Goldbacher was warmly received by the audience. On Rotten Tomatoes, the picture was rated 10 out of 10, and Wayne Myers from the Onita Daily Dispatch called it an embraceable film of the sort that emerges more frequently from elsewhere nowadays than Hollywood, and praised the performances of Page, Watson, Boynton, and Nickel. Since that time, a series of her love relationships began. The first person Watson was seen with was the British TV presenter Frances Buell, who soon left the girl because of her age. It was followed by Emma's first serious romance with the British financier Jay Barrymore. The couple were together for a year and broke up because of the distance. The actress's heavy schedule made it impossible to spend much time together. In 2009, she dated the Spanish musician Rafael Serian, but after half a year, the couple broke up. In addition, Emma became the face of the Autumn Winter Collection in 2009-2010 Burberry and six months later of the Spring and Summer one. By the way, Emma supports the ecological approach to creating clothes. For this reason, she entered into a contract with People Tree Brand, according to which the girl advised the brand on the design of the Spring Collection. The collection was warmly received in February of 2010. I will work for anyone for free if they're prepared to make their clothing fair trade and organic. It's really hard to get people interested in it, but yeah, it's definitely something that I want to champion." On the set of one of the advertising campaigns, she met the lead singer of the one-night-only group, George Craig, who was also a model. Emma became his muse and even starred in his video for the song Say You Don't Want It. But love lasted only a few months because they were too different, according to young people. In 2011, the drama My Week with Marilyn was released, where Emma got a cameo role, Lucy's assistant. But even in a small role, the growth and maturation of the actress was noticeable. At the same time, the actress became the new face of Lancome and received the Style Icon Award at the L Style Award ceremony. For Emma, fashion is a way for everyone to express themselves. Fashion helps us shape our identity. What we wear reflects who we are and what values we stand for. The following year, the viewer could see the girl in the film The Perks of Being a Wallflower, directed by Stephen Shabosky. The story told about a shy and unpopular protagonist who was trying to sort himself out and find real friends and his love in the face of the Watson heroine named Sam. Why do I and everyone I love pick people who treat us like we're nothing? Filming in the drama became one of the most difficult in the career of a young actress. Despite the large, ready-made fan base, the studios were not very eager to finance the film. In order for the movie to be filmed, Emma had to fly to Los Angeles and present the film on her own, defending its implementation. In addition, only six weeks were given to create the material. I'd never worked such long hours or so hard in my life, but it was also obviously the most fun. We did a lot of night shoots, and after shooting, you have so much adrenaline running through your system, it takes a few hours for you to wind down, even though it's like 4 in the morning. The film won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Debut Film and was named one of the top 10 films of the year by the U.S. National Board of Film Critics. During filming, Emma began an affair with Johnny Simmons, who played a supporting role. The relationship captivated the girls so much that she introduced the new boyfriend to her parents. But this relationship didn't last more than a year. The reason for the breakup was the guy's refusal to move to England. During a short period of study at Oxford, the girl started the second serious romance in her life, which lasted two years. That time, it was musician Will Adamowitz, with whom she was first seen in April of 2012. Despite rumors of an engagement and imminent wedding, the couple broke up. The reason was the same tight schedule of Emma and the inability to spend a lot of time together. In 2013, Sofia Coppola's crime drama The Bling Ring was released, where the actress played the role of a self-confident thief. 
Emma treated the role with responsibility. She had a small episode in the film where she danced on a pole. Therefore, during a short period of study at Worcester College, Oxford University, on Saturdays, Emma took pole dancing lessons. The girl admitted that despite her dancing experience, conquering the pylon was not easy for her. I was incredibly ungraceful at first. The upper body strength and the core strength that you need to do it gracefully is crazy. I take my hat off to the women who can do it. Although the film generally received mixed reviews, Watson's performance was almost unanimously praised by critics. Adam White from The Independent later stated that she was wonderful. Watson exudes casual disdain. Come on. Where do you want this? Hi, the kitchen. Okay, back to work. In addition, the girl appeared in the comedy disaster film This Is The End, where she played herself. Next was the role of Noah's adopted daughter in Darren Aronofsky's film called, you won't believe it, but Noah. The director's attitude toward environmental protection led to Emma's serious illness. Darren strictly forbade the use of plastic water bottles on set. Everything the actors used had to be organic or recyclable. Having no water bottles on set at 5 in the morning when you're exhausted and delirious wasn't ideal. I was so tired one morning, I picked up a mug from my trailer and drank some stagnant water that had been there for the duration. So, three months. I was so ill. And again, history repeated itself. When the actress told the director that she could no longer continue filming, Arnofsky decided to use the situation in his own way, replying, use it for the scene. In addition, the actress asked to sew a costume for her that would imitate pregnancy in terms of weight and sensations. There were corresponding scenes in the film. As she later admitted, this experience gave her a new perspective on motherhood. I have a new respect for women, motherhood, and what they do, she said. And in the same period, the girl won the Bad British Style nomination of the British Fashion Awards. At the presentation, she admitted that her idol and an example of the fashion world was Elizabeth Taylor. Emma also won the Britannia Award for British Artist of the Year. She dedicated the prize to her pet hamster, Millie, who died while the actress was on the set of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Emma positions herself as a feminist. She came to this decision after visiting African countries where she dealt with education. You devote so much time and effort and energy to it. Like, where does that come from? I think I've always been this way, and I, I don't know why. Without this part, honestly, it's got to the point it renders mm. everything else that I do meaningless. It just feels empty otherwise. I mm. can't... I feel uncomfortable taking up as much mm. space as I'm mm. taking up and not speaking about any mm. of this stuff. It just doesn't feel right anymore. Since 2014, Watson has been appointed the Goodwill Ambassador for UN Women. A few months later, she launched He for She, the essence of which was the struggle for equality between men and women. At the same time, as the actress herself said, she advocated not only women but also men who suffer from gender stereotypes and social pressure. From a speech launching the UN He for She campaign, both men and women have the right to be vulnerable. Both men and women have the right to be strong. The time has come for us all to perceive gender as a spectrum and not as two opposing ideals. In 2015, two films with Emma's participation were released. The thriller Regression by Alejandro Amenabar and the romantic drama Colonia by Florian Gallenberger. Both films were not the most successful in the career of the actress and received generally negative reviews from film critics. By the way, Watson is known for refusing nudity and bed scenes on the set. That's why understudies are taken for the corresponding frames. Later, an unexpected character appeared on the list of the girl's suitors. In the same year, all the media started talking about Emma's secret relationship with Prince Harry. Allegedly, Prince asked his friends to introduce him to a girl. And at the party, he flirted with Emma all evening and looked in love. The actress denied any connection with the crowned person. Emma soon began dating Princeton alumnus William Knight. This romance with one of the managers of Silicon Valley lasted a little over two years. In 2016, Watson participated in the hashtag Lean In Together campaign. Together with other famous actresses, athletes, and journalists, she spoke about the women who influenced her life and called on the representatives of their gender not to be an amenity, but to unite and support each other. 2017 had been a very productive year for Emma. 
She got the lead role in the musical fantasy Beauty and the Beast, a film interpretation of the famous Disney fairy tale. For the sake of filming, the actress refused to participate in another musical, La La Land. To prepare for the role of Belle, the girl worked hard for three months. She took lessons in singing, dancing, and writing. I'm very proud that I get to take away all the skills that I learned for this film and bring them to the rest of my career. For her lead role in Beauty and the Beast, Emma Watson won the first gender-neutral MTV Movie and TV Award for Best Actor or Actress. Speaking at the award ceremony, she agreed that nominees really shouldn't be gendered because acting is the ability to try on another person's life, and it doesn't need to be divided into two different categories. The film grossed over $1.2 billion at the worldwide box office and was the second highest grossing film of 2017, as well as a ton of positive reviews. Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun-Times felt that her performance was filled with Bell's solid courage, sass, intelligence, and fierce independence. Perhaps this is one of Emma's best roles in recent times. Do you agree? Be sure to share in the comments what other films of the actress besides the Potter saga you like and why. In the same year, the second film with the participation of Emma was released. It was The Circle, directed by James Pinsonald. The plot told about the near future in which there was a conflict between the interests of each individual and globalization. The girl played a young, talented graduate, May, who got a job at a global internet company that wanted to change the world. But the circle didn't live up to expectations. For participation in this picture, Emma was awarded a nomination for the Golden Raspberry Anti Award in the category of the Worst Actress of the Year. Emma healed her disappointment with short-term affairs that followed each other throughout the next year. She had relationships with actor Cord Overstreet, businessman Brandon Wallace, and later Watson was seen with actor Cole Cook. In an interview with Paris Lees, the actress said that she is in a relationship with herself and admitted that after working on herself for a long time, she was quite comfortable being alone. At the same time, Emma considered same-sex couples to be one of the most successful models of relationships. She attributed this to the fact that partners in same-sex relationships have healthier communication skills as they don't adhere to gender roles. A lot of the healthiest relationships I've seen have been between same-sex couples because I think they have to sit down and agree on things. They agree on things between them as opposed to accepting certain sets of assumptions and expectations that are made. In 2019, viewers were able to admire Emma in the film Little Women, based on the novel of the same name by Louisa May Alcott. Saoirse Ronan, Florence Pugh, Timothy Chalamet, and Meryl Streep were her colleagues on the set. The story told about the fate of four girls who were trying to realize themselves in the world of men during the Civil War. Emma was not immediately recognizable, neither in appearance nor in character, but her acting was alive and real. In one of the interviews, she said the following about her character. It's a really good literary device to explain that feminism, there's not one way to be a feminist, which right. we still seem to be struggling with, and right. I'm not totally sure why. Yeah. It's not surprising why the film was highly appreciated by both film critics and ordinary viewers. In addition, the film received six Oscar nominations, including in the Best Picture category. Cash receipts amounted to $218 million, which significantly recouped the cost of implementation. Forbes wrote, Watson has perhaps the most challenging and least audience-friendly role as the proverbial straight woman of the sisters who is put on the defensive when her dreams end up being the most conventional of the lot. Emma said that when choosing a film, she relied on her own intuition, information about who would direct and one single line from the script. There's usually one line that I read and I'm like, okay, I have to say this line. I have to tell this story. It's an instant click. And if there isn't that line, even if the story is great, I'm always a bit meh. In 2020, Emma joined the directors of The Keering Company, which owns the fashion brands Gucci, Yves Saint Laurent, Balenciaga, and Alexander McQueen. Her mission is responsibility for sustainable development. Among other things, the actress is very careful about her own wardrobe. She even created a separate Instagram account where she posts photos of her images from filming and going out. She signs each photo, talking about the materials from which things were made. Emma has been in a relationship with American businessman Leo Robinson since 2019. 
Last year, there were rumors that the actress was going to leave the cinema because of their engagement, but it was later denied by her managers. Perhaps this was due to the fact that Emma had previously stated that her life would be less red carpets and more conferences. The actress herself admitted that the break in work was related to the pandemic, and the rumors were just clickbait. Working with Grint and Radcliffe on an HBO Max reunion special, Harry Potter 20 years later returned to Hogwarts confirmed this. Anyway, little Emma Watson managed to make life after Hermione Granger. And what about Ron? Oh, I mean Rupert. Rupert Grint's acting career was the least successful of the young wizard trio. Even during the filming of Harry Potter at the age of 13, the actor played a red-haired child prodigy in the family comedy Thunderpants. In 2006, viewers were able to see Grint in driving lessons, where the guy played in a duet with his Potter mother, Julie Walters. There, Rupert was a shy teenager who befriended an elderly eccentric actress. Since the actor was a minor and didn't know how to drive, the scenes where he was sitting behind the wheel were filmed in a specially designated area away from the police. Recalling the film, the actor said that taking part in it was the first grown-up thing that I'd ever really done. Fleetingly, the actor managed to star in a family drama produced by the BBC called Children's Party in the Palace. After the popularity surge of the famous franchise, Rupert left school and immersed himself in acting. He later admitted that school never really interested him. By that time, the third and fourth parts of Harry Potter had already been released. In the same year, Rupert was the 16th in the world's top 20 best actors under 25. As for his personal life, there have always been many rumors around the relationship of the young wizard. Rupert successfully kept all his girls a secret. There was even an assumption that Rupert had an affair with Watson, but both denied that information, and Grint stated that Emma was like a sister to him. I love you. As a friend. <laughs> In one of his interviews, he said he didn't like beauties. He preferred unusual girls with a great sense of humor. The first attempts at a serious relationship of a young wizard fell on the same period. From 2004 to 2008, he dated actress Katie Lewis, with whom the actor was together because of their common passion for music. After breaking up with Katie, she was replaced by British singer Lily Allen. They met at the premiere of the fifth part of Harry Potter and for a long time tried not to announce their romance. Remarkably, Rupert began a relationship with both girls after serious upheavals in their lives. For example, Katie quit drugs by the time they met and Lily lost her child and was going through the difficult breakup. In both cases, the guy tried to become a support for the girls and a knight in white armor. But in the end, it didn't work out. The roles chosen in the future didn't work out either. Cherry Bomb, released in 2009, showed a professionally matured actor who was trying to rid the obsessive role of a good red-haired boy. Here, Rupert played a teenager who experimented with drugs, sex, and violence, who at the same time tried to win the heart of a girl. The film failed miserably at the Berlin Film Festival and shouldn't have been released at all, but thanks to the wide fan base that supported the film and even wrote a petition, viewers were able to see it. The film received a mixed response from critics due to the abundance of scenes with marijuana smoking, car thefts, and other illegal activities, which were subject to strong public condemnation. But Grint was still pleased with the film. I loved the script because it was very kind of fast-paced. It was just… it was just different as well from, I guess, kind of Harry Potter, really. In 2010, he got one of the main roles in the black comedy Wild Target, directed by Jonathan Lynn where Bill Nye and Emily Blunt were his on-screen partners. He turned into a homeless young man who, as fate would have it, became involved in a relationship between a contract killer and a con artist. Grint was clearly in the right place. If you don't believe, then watch the movie. But the film was met rather coldly. It received an average rating of 4 out of 10 on review sites. Time Out London only giving it 2 out of 5 stars, saying that it feels like nothing has been thought through. The verdict given by Empire Online is equally negative. It says that the talented cast keeps some low-key action and tired gags from derailing this disappointing farce. In parallel, the actor was seen with Kimberly Nixon, his partner in Cherry Bomb. A passionate love affair that began on the set quickly turned into real life. 
but just as quickly, it faded away. Then, he met theater actress Georgia Groom, with whom Grint would connect his life for many years. In seven years, the couple was seen with wedding rings on their fingers. Ten years later, commenting on his relationship, the actor shared a secret. It's a very natural thing. We're just best friends. We're kind of the same person. We think the same way. That's always made it work. That's why it lasted. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is, but it works and it's great. In addition, Grint is close friends with his Potter antagonist, Tom Felton, who played Draco Malfoy. The guys are so friendly that once they put on the same t-shirts with almost the same inscriptions. Grint's t-shirt said, I love Draco Malfoy, and the message on Felton's t-shirt was, I love Ron Weasley. In 2011, he made a cameo appearance in the popular BBC comedy show Come Fly With Me and starred in the music video for Lego House for a song by his close friend, musician Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran was kind of just becoming a thing. And I played a kind of obsessed fan that wanted to be Ed. In addition, Rupert had the opportunity to try himself in a new role as a model. Together with Tom Felton, he became the face of Los Angeles-based fashion brand Band of Outsiders and posed for their fall collection. Photos were taken in vintage style on a Polaroid, set against the backdrop of the streets of Los Angeles. 2012 was a very eventful year for the young actor. Rupert's filmography was replenished with the historical military drama Into the White, where he played gunner Robert Smith. It was directed by Peter Nass. The film was based on a true story and told about the difficulty of choosing between belief and survival, as well as the conditions under which former enemies become allies. It is after this film that one can say that the maturity of Rupert as an actor and a serious choice of role. In addition to filming a movie, Grint tried himself in new roles. So, he appeared with Julie Walters and Stephen Fry in the commercial Visit England starred in the biopic of Dennis Wilson called The Drummer and was the voice actor of the tape We Are Aliens. Grant also was lucky enough to carry the Olympic flame in London. In 2013, the thriller The Necessary Death of Charlie Countryman was released, where Grant was on the set with Shia LaBeouf, Evan Rachel Wood, Mads Milkison, and Till Schweiger. In addition, in the same year, he appeared in the series Super Clyde. He also began to actively engage in theater, making his stage debut in Jez Butterworth's comedy Mojo, which was a huge success and brought the actor the What's On Stage Award for Best London Newcomer. Grant also tried to voice the cartoon in Postman Pat. You can recognize the voice of Rupert from a hero named Josh. In 2015, the actor appeared in the action comedy Moonwalkers, where Ron Perlman and Robert Sheehan were his partners. By the way, Grant is popular for his weakness for the fans. He tries so hard to make friends with them that at some times he gets into funny situations. I met this drag queen and went back to her little flat with all her drag queen friends because I couldn't say no. They dressed me up and we went to get bagels at 4am. I was in full heels and a leather boa. It was really weird. 2016 was not a very successful year for Rupert. After failing his audition for Eddie the Eagle, the actor became depressed. There were rumors that after that he began to abuse alcohol and even drugs. In public, he appeared not at his best, unkempt, shadows under his eyes, in dirty clothes and unwashed hair. The paparazzi often caught the guy who was pretty drunk. Since 2017, Rupert Grant has been focusing on television series. So he played the role of a modern gangster, Charlie Cavendish Scott, in the British crime television series Snatch. In that picture, the actor first tried himself as a producer. Gleaming bust Albert Hill by Uncle Dean and his clan of gypsy artisans. What on earth are you talking about? <laughs> also, that year, he got the lead role in the TV series Sick Note, where he portrayed the image of the loser Daniel Glass, who was unlucky in life. In parallel, the actor took part in the comedy miniseries Urban Myths, based on the stories that happened or could happen to some famous individuals. Next year, Rupert had a new, non-standard image. We could see him in a classic three-piece suit with a mustache and slick-back hair in the ABC Murder series, which was based on the Agatha Christie novel. There, Rupert played Inspector Chrome and received a fee of $28 million for this role. And in 2019, Grint starred in the mystical series Servant. The show became quite popular, and seasons three and four are planned to be released soon. In 2021, Rupert announced that he planned to retire. 
He was always burdened by popularity, and the birth of his daughter in 2020 finally convinced him of his decision. It was when he became a father that he realized how much he had lost in childhood. Becoming a dad has increased those feelings. Don't get me wrong, I love working on Servant and feel extremely comfortable in a TV environment. But Potter happened at such a young age and I found it hard to deal with the fame side of things. If I ever do see Dan or Emma, fame is one thing we never talk about. Instead of acting, he wants to do something applied, carpentry or ceramics. And the actor will definitely not be left without his money. He has his own company, Clay 10 Limited, which manages investments and income from television and cinema. In addition, Grint admitted that he was critically lacking privacy. His salvation was the quarantine which allowed him to wear a mask outside. Before lockdown, I was always hanging around in B&Q, buying more tools, and I've just started my own miniature pottery production line. If Wednesday's napping, I throw some clay on my wheel and make tiny jugs and bowls. By the way, here's an interesting fact. Rupert got into the Guinness Book of World Records as a person who gained 1 million subscribers on Instagram in a short time. All thanks to the fact that he registered on the network only in 2020, and the first and then the second photos were the pictures of his little daughter. To his fans' disappointment, Grint is not very active in his profile. Turns out, I suck at Instagram. Here's what he wrote under the second photo. Just because I just... Ultimately, I think it just doesn't go with my personality. No. I'm quite a shy person and the thought of kind of sharing my life. Yeah. Just private. didn't seem that it would really... Yeah. At the moment, the actor is completely plunged into fatherhood and it brings him joy. I feel very comfortable being a dad. I'm still kind of coming to terms with what being a dad is, but I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. And in another interview, the actor added, It's amazing how it completely kind of takes over everything. And now, let's move on to our last and main character. What happened to Daniel Radcliffe is what the actors of popular franchises are so afraid of. For many viewers, he remained Harry Potter. Even during the filming of the franchise, Dan made an attempt to prove to everyone that he can be not only a boy who survived. To show himself as a versatile actor, he began to choose very non-standard projects already in his teens. Parallel to filming Harry Potter movies in 2002, Daniel made his debut as a celebrity guest in a West End production of The Play What I Wrote, directed by Kenneth Branagh, who also starred with Dan in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And in 2007, Radcliffe co-starred with Carrie Mulligan in My Boy Jack, a television drama film shown on ITV. Several critics praised Radcliffe's performance as an eight-year-old who goes missing in action during a battle. Radcliffe stated, For many people my age, the First World War is just a topic in a history book, but I've always been fascinated by the subject and think it's as relevant today as it ever was. A year later, Dan decided to try himself in a different direction. The actor published his own poems under the pseudonym Jacob Gershon a combination of his middle name and the Hebrew version of his mother's maiden name, Gresham, in the underground fashion magazine, Rubbish. Years later, the actor admitted that he didn't like his own works and called them terrible. However, Dan is generally known for his self-criticism. The actor doesn't like to watch films with his participation because he is always dissatisfied with something in his performance or appearance. It can be assumed that the very sensational performance of the 17-year-old actor in a West End revival of Peter Schaeffer's play Equus at the Giggle Theatre was a demonstration of his resolute readiness for serious and more adult roles. The actor took on the lead role of horse groom Alan Strang. In one of the scenes, Dan appeared in front of the audience completely naked. When photographs from the performance hit the press, many parents argued to ban Radcliffe from the production. The main argument was that he played in the most popular children's film and such obscene behavior corrupted his audience. However, critical reaction to the production was positive. Due to Radcliffe's strong dramatic performance, the spectacle was nominated for a Drama Desk Award. With the end of filming on Harry Potter, Daniel's diverse range of projects began to grow steadily. After voicing a character in the Simpsons episode Treehouse of Horror 21, Radcliffe debuted as J. Pierpont Finch in a 2011 Broadway revival How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying at the Al Hirschfeld Theatre.
A noble tie that binds all human hearts and minds into one brotherhood of man. Radcliffe's performance in the show earned him a Drama Desk Award, Drama League Award, and Outer Critics Circle Award nominations. In 2012, Daniel appeared in the horror film The Woman in Black, adapted from the 1983 novel by Susan Hill. At the time, he was incredibly excited to be involved with that film and called its script beautifully written. 2013 was a particularly busy year for the actor. He first appeared as American beat poet Allen Ginsberg in the thriller drama Kill Your Darlings, directed by John Krakaitis. In the same year, he played in the romantic comedy film The F Word, based on T.J. Daw and Michael Rinaldi's play Toothpaste and Cigars. And then, he starred in a dark fantasy horror film directed by Alexandre Aja, Horns. Both films were presented at the 38th Toronto International Film Festival. At the same time, Daniel didn't get tired of appearing on the theater stage. Radcliffe played in the Noel Coward Theater in the stage play revival of Martin McDonough's dark comedy The Cripple of Einishman, as the lead Billy Clavin. This role earned him the What's On Stage Award for Best Actor in a Play. By the way, by that time, Daniel was finally tied up with drinking. The support of relatives and friends helped him in that as well as sports. At one point, I got tired of receiving 20 messages a morning, where are you guy, are you okay? I decided to stop drinking and it was very hard for me, I constantly broke down. But when one day I went on a 5 hour walk, I realized that while I was doing sports, I didn't want to drink alcohol. After realizing this, I began to go to the gym every day and train hard. In 2015, Daniel starred in a science fiction horror film, Victor Frankenstein, directed by Paul McGeegan. He also starred in the biographical drama The Game Changers as Sam Hauser, one of the founders of Rockstar Games. The film told the story of the controversy caused by the successful Grand Theft Auto video game series as various attempts were made to halt the production of the games. Regarding Dan's personal relationship with video games, he once admitted that Minecraft made him feel old. I was playing with my godson, or attempting to play, and he was like, explaining it to me and I was saying all the old person things, just like, I don't get it. How is it a game? When does it finish? Dan is not on social media. He says that he's just happy to live without it because he feels complete freedom. He never reads what they say about him. Although his girlfriend has Twitter and he can see with one eye what is happening there. For example, videos with dogs or cool magic tricks. In November of 2015, Daniel Radcliffe received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. If you get to work in this job, you are, by sheer virtue of statistics, one of the luckiest people on earth. And so none of us should, who, are, who are lucky enough to do this should ever forget that. And I promise you that I won't. I will never stop feeling lucky to be here and be a part of this. Daniel starred in the 2016 action-adventure film Now You See Me Too, alongside Mark Ruffalo, Jesse Eisenberg, and Woody Harrelson. The film was a continuation of the extremely successful first film about illusionist thieves. The same year, Radcliffe portrayed Manny, a talkative corpse in the indie film Swiss Army Man with Paul Dano. A peculiar film needed an unusual publicity, and Dan coped with this task perfectly. During the promotional tour, Radcliffe toured New York and Los Angeles with a mannequin of himself. The actor also starred in the critically acclaimed independent film Imperium with Tony Collette and Tracy Letts. The character of Radcliffe, an FBI agent, infiltrated a gang of neo-Nazis. Many critics called that role the most serious project in the adult career of Radcliffe. Between films, Daniel starred off-Broadway at the Public Theater in a documentary theater piece titled Privacy. Besides the fact that Radcliffe sings, he also raps quite well. Once on The Jimmy Fallon Show, the actor effectively read the song Alphabet Aerobics, which caused a storm of applause from the audience. Casually create catastrophes, casualties, canceling cats got their canopies collapsing. Detonate a dama dank daily do and go. Demonstrations, Don Dada on the download. In 2017, the actor starred as Yoshi Ginsburg in the thriller Jungle, which was based on a worldwide best selling memoir of the same name by Yoshi Ginsburg. Also in 2017, Daniel played a drug smuggling pilot in the independent action thriller Beast of Burden and also returned to Broadway in the comedy play The Lifespan of a Fact at Studio 54 Theatre. Since 2019, the limited series Miracle Workers, based on the book by Simon Rich, has been published. 
Each season tells a different story, but the actors remain the same. So Dan tried on the image of an employee of the heavenly office, a cowardly heir to a tyrant king, and a priest. She'll be driving six white horses when she comes. She'll be driving six white horses when she comes. She'll be driving six white horses. She'll be driving six white horses. She'll be driving six white horses when she comes. The following year, he appeared in the action comedy film Guns Akimbo, directed by Jason Lee Howden and co-starring Samara Weaving and Natasha Lou Bordizo. Also in 2020, he played in the thriller film Escape from Pretoria, based on the real-life prison escape by three young political prisoners from jail in South Africa in 1979. Oh yeah, that same year, Dan also played the role of Prince Frederick in the Netflix special Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, opposite Ellie Kemper. Films of various genres and non-recurring roles naturally left the image of Harry behind, although Dan is still very closely associated with him. Today, Radcliffe is an excellent British actor, trying something new all the time and conquering new heights. Radcliffe splits his time between homes in Fulham area of London and the West Village neighborhood of New York City's Manhattan borough. Since 2012, he has been in a relationship with American actress Erin Dark after having met on the set of Kill Your Darlings. The actor's material condition is not growing as rapidly as during the filming of the Harry Potter series, but steadily. The Sunday Times Rich List of 2020 estimated Radcliffe's net worth at 94 million pounds. However, the actor doesn't seek enrichment and is actively involved in charity work. Radcliffe has lent his support to various charitable organizations. He designed the Q-Bed for Habitat's VIP Kids Range, a cube that converts into a bed or chair, with all the royalties from the sale of the bed going directly to his favorite charity, Demelza House Children's Hospice in Sittenbourne, Kent. He has also made donations in support of Get Connected UK, a London-based free confidential national helpline for troubled youth. He once sold a lock of his hair at a charity auction for £751. Also, from time to time, Dan encourages others not to give him gifts for the new year and for his birthday, but to make donations to foundations. Daniel is open about his political and social views, as well as his favorites in the elections. He is a supporter of the Labour Party, although previously supported by the Liberal Democrats. Dan supports the concept of abolishing the British monarchy and replacing it with a republic. He also supports British unionism and opposed the 2014 Scottish independence referendum because he personally likes the UK being known how it is. Radcliffe wasn't raised with either of his parents' religions, considering himself Jewish and Irish. There was never religious faith in the house. I think of myself as being Jewish and Irish, despite the fact that I'm English. In 2019, he took part in the BBC series Who Do You Think You Are? and was very emotional when he read aloud the suicide note left by his Jewish great-grandfather. And we had been blessed with two darling girls, but I can't take worry as you know. But I can't take worry as you know, my love. The series told about how Samuel Gershon spent years setting up a family-owned jewelry store in London and lost everything after a robbery. Gershon tried to get an insurance claim, but police officers, influenced by the anti-Semitic climate of the time, claimed the family had faked the robbery. Facing bankruptcy and feeling that he had let his family down, Gershon took his own life. Radcliffe is supportive of the LGBTQ community. Speaking out against homophobia, he began filming public service announcements in 2009 for The Trevor Project, promoting awareness of gay teen suicide prevention. He first learned of the organization while performing Equus on Broadway in 2008 and has contributed financially to it. I have always hated anybody who is not tolerant of gay men or lesbians or bisexuals. Now I'm in a very fortunate position where I can actually help or do something about it. Perhaps that was the reason for his immediate condemnation of the statements of J.K. Rowling in 2020. Radcliffe penned an essay published by The Trevor Project in which he voiced support for the transgender community and lamented that Rowling's statements had damaged fans' adoration of the Harry Potter books. On January 1, 2022, the film Harry Potter 20th Anniversary Return to Hogwarts was presented with multiple cast members, including the producer and directors of all films. Daniel was happy to see everyone he hadn't seen in 10 years and hadn't spoken to since the end of the filming of the last part of the saga. 
He said, Every part of my life is connected to Potter, and you've seen even more how much it means to people and what a part of people's life it is. It means even more now, and I'm able to appreciate how special that is. Daniel still remains on friendly terms with Emma and Rupert, and also often communicates with Tom Felton and Gary Oldman. Yes, absolutely. We're all kind of all over the place. We don't see each other much. But yeah, I'm still like in contact with all of them. And it's like, like we were all, you know, obviously text Rupert last year when he had his baby. Also, Dan has long been friends with British writer and actor Stephen Fry, who voiced the audio version of the Potter books and also took part in the awarding of the Potter creators at the BAFTA ceremony in 2011. In turn, Daniel took part in the intellectual comedy game QI, where Stephen was the host. After that, Daniel should appear in the action-adventure comedy film The Lost City, opposite Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum. We were scared. There was dehydration, IVs, jellyfish, boat-to-boat -boat transfers, uh, you know, no, no porta-potties in a jungle. And the network has already spread a picture from the filming of the actor's new amazing image. He will perform musician Weird Al Yankovic in Weird The Al Yankovic Story, a biographical film produced by the Roku channel. At the end of the year, Daniel plans to play Charles Kringis in an off-Broadway revival of Stephen Sodheim's musical, Merrily We Roll Along. As you can see, the life of each of the famous trio has developed differently. All the famous wizards, Emma, Rupert, and Daniel, are trying to prove that they are much more than the on-screen heroes that the audience loves. Answering the question, is there life after Harry Potter? As this video shows, yes. We hope that today's heroes will be able to find happiness and will be able to observe their non-standard roles, inspiring projects, and new victories. And we will never forget about the magical world that they gave us. Even after 20 years, the Harry Potter films still delight and inspire us, and the special effects look like a day out of date. If you click on this icon, you'll see how the magical world of Harry Potter was created. What funny situations happened on the set? What inspired the art directors when designing the sets of the film? Follow the link and find out everything. Thank you for watching this video till the end. It will be great if you support it with your like. And as usual, the biographer was with you. And now we say goodbye for a little while. See you later.